Digest After Dark, and we're back. Uh, unfiltered and uncensored talk with young alumni of historically black colleges and universities. Thanks for joining us for another episode uh, on HBCUdigest.com and on Sirius 142 HBCU, Howard University's uh, digital imprint on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Uh, back in the house with uh, Ors the Morganite, uh, Frat Brother Katie, uh, Line Brother Katie, I should say. Who's yeah, dr- yeah. driving and ordering food, um, despite bragging about yeah. having a microphone in his home, not at home, recording live from the road. And Bro, um, you got to tell the whole world my business. <laughs> and Tiff once again about to get thrown off the show. So I'm not getting thrown off of nowhere. Um, mm, I'm gonna leave that alone. Um, <laughs> Hold up! Oh, did I miss something? No. I know I, I didn't record in a while, but that sounds personal. What kind personal. of mentor? <laughs> So we, I want to let me, but let, like that will hurt my feelings, and then I'll be sad. No, that's why I don't, I'm not saying anything. You're not getting thrown off anything okay. yet. Um, <laughs> so let's so let's start off with um, last week we had a commencement episode, but it was it was kind of serious because we talked to Una and Tay about their experience in advanced degree programs, and it was really it was really powerful in the sense to to hear two HBCU grads talk about the process of getting into and surviving graduate school um so i'm hoping a lot of people got something out of it so i guess we're going to continue the commencement theme and talk about the way that some of these young people are doing teasers for commencement and i don't know if they're teasers trailers or what people are referring to them as but if you get on uh twitter youtube you see these extended video presentations of folks celebrating their pending graduation so last year i think one of the top ones was a brother from virginia state um who did like a like a like a remake of lupe's touch the sky and that was that was cool and that was to be expected because virginia state has a you know an elaborate um video production program so i I wasn't surprised by that and i i enjoyed it this year ors um is the is the brother from fam you um who has it reminds me a little bit of the Far Side's old music video, um, where he's kind of walking through campus and people are like throwing stuff. He changes his outfit and all kinds of stuff as he's walking through the campus. Um, what wh- first? What's your reaction to the, the the young people doing these kind of videos? Um, and do you think that it's? I obviously think it's helpful, but do you think it it it's? Hey, great job. We love to see it. Want to see more of them? Or is it, eh, y'all are bordering on the point of doing too much? I mean, it depends on where you are. Obviously, <laughs> there's a conservative bone in me that's like, you know, I wouldn't do that personally, but I know people who would. I even forget, I'm not going to say who it was, but a friend of mine was talking about they wanted to go redo theirs because they saw, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, I need to go back to school. It wasn't, and, it, and wasn't up to, degree. it wasn't up yeah. to par. <laughs> right. Especially at FAM, because, you know, FAM has that, that very iconic shot that you see a lot with um, the Eternal Flame and right. Lee Hall. Yeah. And people people now have like these orange and green like smoke machines and they catch the, <laughs> they catch the flame when it's on at night and the sun is clear and right. it's like the lights are on. So it's, so it's a lot different than than what was done even when I was in school, and that was only a couple of years ago. No, so. I could I could understand the photography because there are a lot of HBCU campuses that are picturesque like that. So FAMU is one, Eternal Flame. Bowie State actually has um, what is that? That they got a flame in the middle of campus. Um, you know Howard has Founders Founders Library, um, and the, and the and the and the yard. I mean, so there there are some campuses where it's appropriate where you can do an all out photo shoot and it looks, hey, that's great because, you know, not only are you looking good as a as a soon to be graduate, but the campus just has a great presentation like that. But see, but video is the next step of that. So when you like in, in his video, he starts in front of Lee Hall. The, the, it's Mr. Famu, So he's Greek. So he goes through the set. He goes past the Greek wall. Like it, it encompasses his entire experience that's a really like big part it's probably the heart it's really the heart of famu's campus Mm -hmm. is mlk which runs from you know all the way from the the end where the train tracks are all the way down to um where like the palmettos and stuff are so it's a big point of the campus and video was just the next step of that to show like before you may have done a long photo shoot in front of all these different places and put them all together in like one folder. 
Now we're just doing videos and adding music and choreography. And I'm sure we're only seeing the beginning of this. Uh, by the time we get to fall graduations and then into next year, spring, I'm sure we're going to be seeing, you know, virtual reality stuff and stuff like that. <laughs> it's going to continue to to grow. The, and and first of all, let me let me because I'm old, the, the inclination for most folks out there thinking I hate this. I actually love it because I think it's, it's positive press for the school and it's young people doing positive things. I don't really see any any of the students doing anything um you know, provocative, like they're not cussing. Wait, wait, you didn't see, you didn't see the family criminal justice student one? Maybe I might have missed that one. What did I miss? Ooh, so there was a criminal justice student, and I oh, find well, the, the picture where he was looking at the at the body, looking at the the dead body. <laughs> now that was, that was interesting because I said I saw on social media he was defending it, saying you know a lot of people, if you saw somebody in a lab coat who wanted to be a doctor, you wouldn't criticize that, and if you saw somebody who was who wanted to be a judge and they had on a you know a robe and had a gavel. You wouldn't criticize that. So why are you criticizing me acting out my career ambition of being, I guess, a forensic or homicide investigator? I guess what I'm saying is that, but it still sensationalizes homicide. (laughs) And anyone, obviously within the the black community, we are um, we are affected by, um, you know, by high rates of violence in different areas. And it's a noble thing to go do that. I have friends who are in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I just think taking making your graduation picture something that's going to be a representation of you celebrating, you know, four to six years of hard work and sacrifice to be leaning over uh, a dead another body. dead body of another black person <laughs> just really doesn't sit well for me personally. Now, again, you can do what you want to do. I just don't want that type of picture coming in my mail saying, <laughs> thank you for my graduation, you know? <laughs> so you thought that one was, was bordering on doing too much. And of course, it came from the the capital doing too much. I love my school though, but I wasn't. I was not. When I saw it, I said, "This is a family coming up to student. He took classes in the commons. This is probably what it what it is." And and again, I, I, I'm I'm sure he's going to be very successful in his career. And it definitely is a moment that brought brought some attention his way. I just I'm a little more touchy with with murder and homicide and and stuff like that. So for me, I just didn't really like the. The imagery of it. That one kind of pushed the envelope, yeah. It, it's gra- Graduation is supposed to be celebrating a moment of success and celebration leading towards your next next point in your career. And there's many different ways you can show yourself doing forensics or doing, you know, you can get very creative with it. I thought it was less creative and more for shock value. <laughs> but again, you know, it had it, it, it made an impact. We're talking about it now. Um, that was good. But I think it shows that students are always going to push push the envelope. I'm sure if you ask the student ten years from now, he probably have different opinions about it because obviously you you change as you mature. As you mature, right? Mm-hmm. Tiff, what do you what do you think about these the commencement trailers? Sorry, I was muted because chewing. Oh my god! Um, as I was saying. Um, I guess I'm like indifferent to it only because, I mean, like if I see something and I'm like, damn, that was great. I can appreciate it. But like, I don't really care either way. Really? Yeah. I think, I think there's two, there's two ways I look at it. One, the artistic. Well, I can say that I would like to see more, I guess, content or how I got here, like an interview interview style thing, more so than just it being on the timeline for likes and shit. I mean, likes and stuff. Oh, uh, boy. Um, would it, but would it go viral if it was just like a a stand up kind of interview with some if I I mean of course there should be some artistic whatever with it but if I was using it for my purposes to show students that I'm working with them at home I would definitely use something like that but if it's just like you taking a picture and there's and you're just on the yard and you look nice or there's like cool effects on it okay but what else can I put with this to make it make sense to somebody that's trying to get where you are but Katie, don't you think that that that's the kind of thing like these presentations are the thing that 
induce young folks to say, oh, I'm going to check out, you know, that school because it looks like it's live there. Actually, no. To really? be perfectly honest, mm-hmm. no. Because that would suggest that a whole bunch of high school students are following you. And we know that's not the truth. This is purely self-interest. I don't personally hate it, though. But it goes viral, though. Like, it's, it's yes, I agree. Yeah. It starts out with followers, but enough people okay. share it and then other people get access to it. And, and what I compare it to is this is the same generation, if I'm not mistaken, that was doing promposals where you would get a whole bunch of people from your high school together and say, hey, will you go to prom with me? You know what? And that wasn't a thing. That is starting me. to become a thing. And I, 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 I wonder if this is a chicken and egg thing. Like I, I do. I do believe it is. Because, I mean, like, I think the first time I saw it was towards the back end of my college career. So that was in 2012. It's 2019. Where people was we matriculating a lot of these students. Renting Ferraris and yes it's the same thing <laughs> bro it's so it's so crazy when i see this stuff i'm like yo these people's parents like people were really like no one had on no, nothing designer with no ferragamo belts at my prom like nah my, like my prom the, the best part of my prom was that we had dj big john aka that bad would be cranking come and do like a five minute set with angie ann's because my we called into the radio station i remember she was time, doing the proms i remember yes. that, yeah <laughs> my, my high school one of the proms that she came through with DJ Big John he did like a five minute go-go set then we had like a go-go after party or whatever interesting but, but that was had... like that that was the highlight it wasn't no, it wasn't no it wasn't no Ferraris pulling up and most you may have had like somebody's parents Benz that was like the <laughs> with, but let you me, know let me with a car seat in the too. back <laughs> <laughs> let me interject this too though right because I remember I think part of it is how much is this stuff costing so let's just say for the sake of argument you're not paying for a production team right how much does a uh, um, a DSLR camera cost? Right, you know, five hundred dollars, and you get to keep it for the rest of your life. So all you need is one person with a camera. First of right? all, that's from the school of journalism. That's I was going to say, if you out. if you're at the right school, if you're at Virginia <laughs> State or FAMU, you can get the you equipment. Mean, exactly. So it's, the equipment is almost. Coppin has a, a recording studio. Mm-hmm. Like I think every student, every school that has an art department has a recording studio. So it's not like all you need is access to the studio, and as a student. You get access just because you're a student, because they people want, they want you to take the classes, so they're not going to say no, you can't come in here. So yes, let's do some club stuff inside of the art room. Do you, you know think I mean? every school could do this? Like, so it makes sense for Howard, it, like the bigger HBCUs, to do it. But if a school like, and this is no shade when I say this, like, is it if Voorhees, a Voorhees student, did it? Do you think we get the same response? I mean, they. I, I hate to say it, but they don't have to compete because it's, it's the exposure of a Howard student, a FAMU student, a Tennessee State student, or whatever is going to get it's going to get more eyes quicker. If you're from Voorhees, you're going to have to have some serious weight coming behind. You got to have a network, right? Yeah, yeah, and, all, and also because I mean, again, just just the fact of like my freshman class at FAM is bigger than like sixty percent of HBCUs. So even if it just went viral within my freshman class, that's thousands of people. That's bigger than schools like Miles or Wiley or a list of other schools mm. whose the entire campus doesn't have just what my freshman class has. So it's 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 different and difficult. I wonder if schools should take the initiative to try to produce these things. So the students are obviously doing it on their own and they're very creative and they're doing a good job. Um, cause it's going viral, you know, media outlets are picking them up. Do you think that the school should invest and start trying to do some of these videos? Only for the top students. Okay. Um, I don't think only for the top students, only because you don't know what it took for a student to get to the end point. And if you only show the quote top students, you'll miss a student with a story that you really might need to hear. Like, but how much investigating are we going to do to find the best story for every graduation? It, that, let me tell you how hard that is to if do. If you put so, out, if you put out a call, and Howard does put out a call. Well, a lot of schools do, but the the question is: one, are students willing to share it? Two, I was willing, will they will they share it? I was on the radio with the president. Uh, well, you you probably bodied your way through to the radio. Um, I did not. Um, so, wow. but, but the other thing is, the will they Don't do it? Me. Will they do it on time? And just because a student may want to share something, it's like or said, like they may get there and be like, well, if if I put this out there now, what what is that going to sound like? You know, two years, five years, ten years down the line. So 
I, you know, what may be a good idea now um, may not be going going forward. So it is it is hard for those students to tell that story. And I think that students and rightly so, they may not trust the university to be as creative as they might be um, with doing some of this stuff, because these students, you know, they, they put videos out and do things. They don't have to worry about copyright infringement. A university has to has to think about that. Or how much sound are we using and how much of these marks do we want to show? And um, what's the liability of shooting a scene like this on campus? The students aren't really constrained by that. If you drop the camera like, OK, you drop the camera. If we drop it, that's a procurement issue. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> there's a, there's Which, a, and, and because there's so much gray area with that, why would the, stu- the schools waste time? And I think that would um, kind of diminish the uh, the the whole feeling of doing your own video. Well, that and that's another thing that I want to get into. So I want to continue on this track about commencement, because the next thing I want to talk about is if this is what we're going through with videos, wait until these crossing the stage moments come up. <laughs> And we saw what we saw how it went down last year. So I wanna, every year, I want to see how you guys feel how it's going to be this year. Dodgers at the dark. We'll be right back. Dodgers at the dark, and we're back. Uh, just had a conversation about these uh, pre-commencement trailers online, um, and now we want to parlay that into a conversation about crossing the stage. So every year, we have to have this dialogue about what students and graduates do when they cross the stage and it delves into areas of like respectability politics and liability and um all kinds of things that are all legitimate to talk about but i guess the the first question i would ask you guys is if the videos are approaching doing too much what do you guys expect on the stage this year considering last year we had people chest bumping the chancellor doing a full drum major routine um praise dancing a number of things so what do you do you guys expect to it to be on par with last year a little bit more than last year what do you guys think are go- is going to happen all the way up <laughs> if they couldn't do more <laughs> i mean i'll say this so a lot of schools and we were talking about this in the chat earlier today um because one of the guys in the chat from Southern was like, y'all have more than one commencement. I'm like, yeah, I think that schools like the bigger, the bigger schools have more procedures in place. The graduations, I mean, the, act, the individual commencement ceremonies are shorter. Mm-hmm. So like some schools have two, sometimes three, even a school like Howard, they have their like Friday thing where you actually say your name and stuff. And then Saturday, y'all just kind of sitting there. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's ways that schools have like the bigger schools kind of have remove that from the the ceremony possibility i don't think it matters as much as the small schools because they don't have a time issue if you only have you know at most 500 graduates you're not going to have a big issue with with time versus a school like where i graduated from where you got close to a thousand and you're outside in may on a football field with no shade right it's a very different different thing but i think students are going to do what they do what they do i mean obviously the the people who are a part of greek organizations are going to do their their thing um but one thing i noticed is usually men more than women which is kind of interesting mm-hmm. like you you normally see the more outlandish things from from male students you really don't see it from a lot of the women students and maybe because they're wearing heels they don't really want to like fall and really you know go all the way out but <laughs> um because i have seen that before um people fall in heels trying to do something too much on the stage so but i think i think students are going to find ways to you know do stuff i wouldn't be surprised someone has confetti and like light some confetti off in the middle of the thing or like the little smoke confetti handhelds it's just a matter of time until these things go from graduation pictures onto the stage right and so of course i expect it to be over the top but what i would like to see this year is that um schools don't overly penalize students or graduates who decide to do things. So like remember last year Central um find a few young men. I think they were actually all alphas, but you know, whatever. Um they find <laughs> <Okay>. those young men. 
<laughs> That's a shot. Okay. What is going I'll, on? I'll respond momentarily. <laughs> they withheld their degrees or something like that. And it, it even though they went viral for what they did and their accomplishments, the story itself on the back end central withholding and or um finding them for for their actions, that produced bad press. So like this year, I, I kind of want everybody to be a little bit smarter. Is this is this is this Central State or Cent- North Carolina Central? Central State. Now I'm let me. About Central State. Now let me when, say. I'm, let me, from, I'm from. I'm from. I'm a Miag baby. When you say Central, I mean right. I mean, North Carolina Central. North Carolina Central. Right. And you know, I don't know nan nothing about sports like that. Oh, so and, I don't and know that's why. interesting because we're going to be talking about sports in the last segment. Um, Even what? better. Let me say for Central State real I quick. I didn't produce this. Now I had a I had a con a conversation with. Um, Former uh, female HBC president of the year, uh, Cynthia Jackson Hammond, extraordinary president. The sister is sharp, Gra- uh, Grambling alumna. Now, she had an experience where she had a Q one year who was stomping and performing. And his foot, you know, the, these these stages, some, sometimes that parts of it are the, all of it is rented. But there are parts of it where there are specific platforms where you have a podium or something else or where a graduate may stand. The Q was performing. He stomped and his foot went through. This part of the staging. <laughs> okay, so that's so unfortunate. Now that, of course, you would expect that from a cue. Um, Alpha bias. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that painted her in her reaction and interpretation to should I let these students go go all the way off on the stage? Because she's thinking it ain't but for the grace of God that when he went through the stage that he didn't cut his leg open. Or that he didn't that he didn't fall through it and break his leg. Yeah, that that's real. So um, and, and now yeah, imagine that happens. Or the whole stage caught fall down. Everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone falls. Or that happens, and you're thinking about something that goes viral. You talking about negative press? Wait till somebody gets hurt doing something like this, and the ambulance yeah. has to come in and and stop commencement because somebody needs medical attention. It only takes one. So I understand the the executive view of this like y'all think it's funny until somebody flips and misses you all are operating on the impression that you're going to flip and execute it perfectly <laughs> and you don't you don't work you don't think about those flowers that are standing on the side of the stage if you slip and miss sisters in heels praise dancing one of them heels goes out or you trip over a microphone cord or other uh, other kind of things like and and I get it from an executive standpoint, but I also get it from a cultural standpoint because you don't get but so many opportunities to celebrate like that, right? Yeah, and I, I'm from, I, I'll say this, um, because it's really tough to legislate this, right? Right. How many people, if let's say 500 graduates, you have 500 graduates, how many of them are coming to the uh, graduation practice mm-hmm. where these guidelines are clearly stated? Mm-hmm. Only the only the only the kids that care about the quorum come to the practice. Everybody you must else, not. You must not have went to Morgan. You didn't go to practice. You don't show up. You don't go to Morgan. <laughs> you don't go to practice. You don't graduate. If you don't. You don't get your degree. Um, that's true. Right, I didn't. Know that was a thing. I didn't know that was a thing for some schools. <laughs> you got to get that that's card real. so you can get your degree that day. Yep. You got to get that. I got to have that card. Um, have otherwise, it yes. <laughs> otherwise, you got to wait for it to come in the mail. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's tough. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, first of all, Cobham, we ain't giving degrees the day of anyway. We don't have um, our, our um, administration just isn't big enough to print that many of that fast. Oh, no. Uh, You're bad mouthing Cobham. Um, <laughs> I love Cobham to death, but it just ain't happening with the five people that's in that office. Is Cobham one of those schools where they perform at the commencement? Yes, but we're, um, for some reason, it's mostly Christians, right? So it's a lot more praise dancing than you see the Greeks, um, you know, doing stuff. And we don't have a deep band, so you won't have any drum majors going crazy. It's, it's really just the. It's really just that church feel. Like every time somebody, every time you have a cotton graduation, it's just like, oh my God, I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> it's funny because you don't see every school do that. So I However, can't, I can't. One caveat. There was a proposal on stage with the university presidents and the provost that I saw a couple years that's ago. That's doing too and, much. Mm-hmm. Now that's holding up the program. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't like that. See, I, that that's something that probably should have been booed because now you're holding up everything like i i enjoy black love i support it but a proposal a good proposal should take a good at least six or seven minutes so the commencement carried <laughs> on hold on because the video didn't go viral the commencement carried on they walked right past them and kept handing out um while he was proposing they kept they kept while calling he was names proposing. yeah 
But I mean, hey, yo, but I'm to done. the larger point, but to my larger That's point. That's black excellence. These, these kids, you, <laughs> indeed. Indeed it is. They kept the program going while he proposed to his girl. Yeah, that's real. But um, <laughs> to my larger point, these kids do pay a graduation fee. Mm -hmm. And so part of that gives them a sense of entitlement that I'm going to do what I want since I paid to be on the stage along with paying the tuition. And I paid for the degree, the right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only so much stopping them that you can do. And then you're right. It's going to take for somebody to get hurt and for it to be like, all right, rude awakening. We can't continue this. So let me let me give two notes on this. One, every school doesn't do it. You don't see people performing at Fisk. You don't see people performing at Hampton. Um, they just have, I guess, a culture where it's like, yeah, you can try it. You might get tackled off this stage. Um, Man, Harvey would throw that walker at you. <laughs> <laughs> but there, you know, you mostly see it at um, the Publix. And that's, and that's, hey, that's, that's part of the culture. But they do have to mitigate the, the, the risk associated with it um, and the, the coverage of it. Because again, it can easily become a story like, oh, great. Graduation was three hours long, which, by the way, the trustees are not here for. Every time we have these stories, what you don't see is the is the trustees hauling the president and the provost into a meeting. Like, how are y'all going to shorten this ceremony? Because we, as or said, we're not sitting out here for three and a half hours in the sun like this every time. And you got people in the audience falling out. And getting hot and leaving because they don't want to sit through it all that time. Jared, were you were you at Morgan when that that initial kind of uh, where people got him and left? Well, no. So yeah, people he'll give and leave every year. We, right. we, we have we have graduates walk off the field, but um, <laughs> that's a Morgan tradition. <laughs> but but, um, but no, you know, initially, obviously, Morgan always had their graduation with graduate school and undergrad together. Mm -hmm. And I think after 2014, mm -hmm. there was a big stir from undergraduate students and from the board. Like, yeah. we have to separate this. Like, the school has gotten too big. Like, it's you okay can't be for giving tradition. out 50 doctorates. Yeah, right. And doing the doing the hooding and all that stuff. Reading the whole and title of the dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, the dissertation be six paragraphs long, and <laughs> it was just crazy. And I remember. They tried to separate it one year and it was a big fuss and the graduate students like called the Baltimore Sun and all this stuff. And then eventually, I guess Morgan just said, we'll take the bad press, whatever. Mm -hmm. And now it actually full. They actually now have two separate ceremonies. They have, they have a grad school on Friday and undergrad on Saturday. But Morgan's approaching what's going to happen. Like, at like Sam, you they have two separate commencements on the same day. Mm -hmm. They have like different schools at different times, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And I feel like schools like Morgan, like a and like FAM are going to be moving to a model where like these PWIs for graduations on Thursday, Friday, Saturday mm -hmm. and Sunday. Like UH has like four graduations mm -hmm. because there's no way to, to make it possible to do a full commencement with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 graduates. And that's the that's the level in which we're going to. So. I think saying students have a certain saying back to Katie's point, students have a certain level of like, oh, I, I earned this. You did, but they have to make it feasible as well for people because, quite frankly, these schools are getting so big that there's no way to efficiently confer 500, 600 plus degrees at one point at two o'clock in the middle of the summer. Do you think if schools went to a formula where they always broke the graduation out? So let's say you start the ceremony, you have your main commencement speaker, and then you break out to individual colleges and schools that you would have as many people performing because it's in my mind and I might be wrong. I can't recall being at too many commencements where it was broken out and people still backflipped on the stage. Like they do that I, when you have the main audience of the football field. Like if you're a huge stadium, uh -huh. if you got the whole huge stadium watching, that's one thing. But if you got the whole Hill Fieldhouse watching, that's something else. But it, but how but Howard is Howard is brilliant because they have that Friday ceremony. I was about where, to say, like Yeah. Howard had I mean, same thing, same thing with Spellman. Like Spellman has Spellman graduation is like four days mm -hmm. because you get down well, there and they have Howard is church. the entire week. Yeah. So like So how does that week. work where they do it the whole week for people who don't know? Say it again. How does that work? So for people they who are listening, a, don't each know. Each individual have, yeah. school and or college has their own ceremony where your name is called. So commit not commencement, but graduation ceremonies are all week. And then Saturday is the grand commencement on the yard. And so you don't see people like turning up 
well, people be turned on the yard, but they're not performing on the yard. At if the if you're going to perform, you're going to perform at your seat. Yeah. When your name, or, yeah, or the day before, whenever your ceremony is, when your name is called. Yeah, your name's not called at Howard on Saturday when you have regular Unless you're like uh, I think well, yeah. a doctorate or something like that where your name is called at the commencement. Yeah. Undergraduate, undergraduate students. Through masters or whatever. I think. No, master's is, I think, commencement too. But yeah, no, bachelor's. Uh... See, they got to do something because, and, and here's the other reason, like more and more of these HBCUs are getting, um, in my mind, higher profile speakers, right? Um, so you, you, we've always gotten like legislators and stuff like that. Now you're starting to get like celebrities at some of these campuses. And so I think that you run the risk if you are running too long, Sometimes the speaker likes to stay and watch it. But if y'all start going too long, what you're going to have is the speaker leaving. They're going to say, I'm not I'm not sitting through all of this. I'm not staying for pictures. I'm not staying for autographs. And you miss a moment and it's actually maybe missing an opportunity to network because you haven't run the program as efficiently as you could have. So I don't know if it if it matters to the students. I don't know if it if it should matter. Um, but it's something that those things and the, the, the reaction of the trustees, that's that is not even to mention the reaction of the media, which, you know, if they come in to cover it, they only have a certain amount of time to grab interviews, pictures and sound before they have to go back and cut a story on it. So they can't sit out there for hours and hours and hours. So I, I don't I don't I don't know what the line is between execution and expression. And I think it almost has to rest with every campus reading the temperature of what your student's going to do. If you're fam, you, and you know, they're going to backflip, you probably should break it out. If you're Talladega and you don't have that concern, you probably, you know, proceed as, as you normally would. And if you're copping, you know, you keep, you keep on praise dancing. Cause that, I mean, as long as they're not falling out, I mean, it's okay. They eventually get across the stage, right? Yours wasn't too long, right? Katie? No, nah, it wasn't no, no longer than my high school graduation. See, and this yeah, and everybody know everybody, so we was having fun. We weren't even paying attention to what was going on. You on stage. weren't even paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna lie to you. I ain't gonna lie to you. And this is why Kaba continues to <laughs> to suffer in his <laughs> in his reputation against Morgan. Um, we uh, <laughs> okay. Nah, sure. nah. Well, yeah. Don't go there because I know what you were gonna say. Um, hey, here we go. <laughs> When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some new coaches at Morgan, uh, namely and Howard um, and the new culture of uh, bringing in high profile assistants and former NBA players to run HBCU uh, basketball programs. The Dodgers After Dark will be right back. <laughs> Dodgers at the dark and we're back. Um, people throwing shade about new coaches. Tiffany not weighing in. Um, not a sports fan. So we have had a big run on in some notable names being hired at HBC basketball programs in recent years. So the two most recent, Kenny Blakely, uh, a Blake Me. Let me let me. I'm sorry, a DC product who played uh, for Duke University was an assistant. Um, a lot of a lot of big time programs, Harvard, uh, Delaware, a number of programs. He he's he's coming to Howard. And then you have uh, Kevin Broadus, who's a, a Maryland University of Maryland assistant, um, going to lead up the Bears basketball program. Um, this is on the heels of Juan Dixon, uh, former University of Maryland standout guard, Baltimore City product, won a national title with Maryland. He's now running the program at Coppin. This is on the heels of Kenny Anderson going to Fisk. Um, Jarvis Hayes getting an assistant coaching job at Morehouse. So, you, you know, you have a lot of former NBA players, a lot of high caliber um, college assistants finding their way to HBCUs, mostly in basketball, but you're starting to see it in football as well. Don't forget Lindsey Hunter, in Mississippi, Lindsey Hunter, in, uh, Mississippi Valley, um, yeah, Todd Day at Philander Smith uh, College. So there's a lot of a lot of them. Um, Daryl Armstrong used to be at Clark Atlanta. So uh, George and I think George Lynch, uh, who was an NBA, a, a longtime NBA role player, took his place. She she was down there as an assistant as well at so, Clark Atlanta. So you have all of these this pipeline, which I'm going to talk about from the NBA to the to the to the HBCU ranks. 
But first of all, let me ask you guys. So it, it, obviously, I would, I would imagine this would be positive for the HBCUs for the name recognition of the name exposure alone. Um, since all of us have a new coach coming in, um, what do you guys think about one, these these new coaches? And to the prospects that it presents for HBCUs to to get further on the map in their city, in their region, as a basketball product. Hey, Katie, I'm gonna start with you because you actually you're in proximity to Coppin, and Juan Dixon is like a like a hero in Baltimore. Um, uh, so what, what? I mean, first having gone through a, it was a tough year. Um, expected, you know, for Juan in his first year. What is your reaction to him running the program and, and the prospects of Coppin returning to glory? Um, I'm a little indifferent, right? Because I don't think name recognition means you can recruit. Mm -hmm. I am praying for his successes. I want Coppin to be successful, but honestly, I think they were just trying to attract students to the school. And I'm not sure that Juan Dixon was that answer. Um, and now I, you can say that for all of the um, HBCUs that have hired, you know, former NBA athletes or college, high profile college assistants. Can you recruit? Because, see, a lot of my problem with Baltimore in general, with the Maryland sports uh, network in general, is that a lot of the top talent leaves Maryland. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do you keep the Kevin Durants from leaving Maryland? How do you keep Carmelo Anthony in the state of Maryland? Even if they don't go to HBCUs, how are you keeping them here? And then once you get those, those that tier, that caliber of athlete to the Maryland schools, then how do you get there? their teammates that were really good as well to come to your schools. Cause that's what you're aiming for. You know, for a fact, if you ain't getting ESPN um, sponsorship, then you ain't going to ever get a high profile college athlete, but you can definitely get that second tier student who just wants to go to school and play basketball. It's so, so how do you recruit that? How do you recruit that student? It's so interesting because you are so right. Every time I watch college basketball outside of the HBCU games, it's, I mean, Villanova, Temple, Syracuse, North Carolina, I mean, it's it's nothing to hear somebody from from Washington, D.C., from Prince George's County, you know, Oxon Hill, Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland. I mean, you hear these guys that are starting for these power five conferences all over the mid-Atlantic. And it's like, what? How did it, how did he get out? of? First of all, how did he get out of Maryland? Like so that nobody goes to Maryland, apparently. And that's, fine. Racist. And that's fine. I'm with that. I hope Maryland fails. But <laughs> I mean, in the, the University of Maryland, that is. <laughs> Oops. But it, it is to say, if you can't keep those guys at the University of Maryland, then the honorable mention, the second team all counties, the third team all counties, can we honestly keep those guys too? I think Maryland ruined the culture, though. So people well, don't believe in the basketball in the state of Maryland in general. Maryland, and so now you got to combat that as well. But don't forget, Maryland's top two players right now from uh, from uh, from Maryland. Jalen Smith is from Baltimore. He went to Mount St. Joe's. Mm-hmm. Anthony Cowan went. To, he went to St. John's. He's from PG. So they do. They do always. They do have some local boys every once in a while playing for the Terps. Um, and they had. And they have their recruiting class is pretty deep. They, they've done a decent job. Even going back to, to Nick Faust when 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 uh, Turgeon first got there, or whatever. But d- saying, I mean, Maryland is not a very big state. So I think I think to have the idea that kids who are from like no one did it. No one ever did it better than John Thompson Jr., old man John Thompson, mm-hmm. getting Reggie Lewis, getting David Wingate. I mean, even going down to Tidewater and getting Lalonzo Morning, getting Allen Iverson, Allen Iverson, uh, Victor Page. Like I mean, when you so when you look at we look at the the history of what Georgetown has done. You know, they were probably the best at getting the best people from D.C., from Baltimore, and from the subsequent you know kind of kind of region. I think it's difficult now with these national contests. I mean, don't forget, Markel Fultz is number one pick in the draft. He's from Upper Marlboro, mm-hmm. like, you know, and he went to University of Washington. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what it shows is that there really isn't there really isn't an apparatus to do this. But even going back to where HBCUs are, I think that where HBCUs can do best is really doing better at getting those players who, instead of going to Siena, or Vermont, mm-hmm. or New Hampshire, or, or Lafayette. I mean, there are tons of local talent who end up going to these same kind of FCS-style schools, go to St. Francis, and they don't go to HBCU. And I just Creighton, think that is because, right. I, I, yeah, William and Mary, like, I mm-hmm. mean, so when you look at it, like, they're on the same exact level as us. They're both, you know, they're not going to get, they're not gonna get a, a, a uh, at-large bid, 
they have to win their conference tournament type schools mm -hmm. and they're still not coming to our institutions even though we can probably offer just as good or a better package it's starting I think it requires them to find that it's starting to turn a little bit but to katie's point and to yours it, it comes down to the recruiting and I, I guess the question would be and tiffany you got to get in on the conversation here how much of the recruiting is based on the relationship you can develop with the person who's recruiting you versus in the nature of, of, of athletics? It's how much do you appear on television? How good are your facilities? How live is your game day experience? So knowing that there's two areas that an athlete may focus on, what do you as a recruiter? How do you how do you sell them on what you know could be deficits in their eyes? Am I answering first? Yes. Um. So this isn't something that I actually have experience in, because. But you recruit I, students who are choosing from different campuses, and there are different oh, reasons for why for why they are choosing. So when you yeah, when you know what those reasons are, how do you still make the sale? Um, I don't focus on where it is the campus may lack, if that makes sense. I'm going to tell you everything that's great about the campus first and explain to you why you belong here. Now, is everything perfect? No, you shouldn't think that it's perfect. But will you get to where you say that you want to be? Highly likely. So I don't try to sell um, on, an, on an athletic dream because honestly, I, I that's not my strong area. I don't do that. Um... But, you know, that's that's what I focus on. And I'm talking to, to the parent, too, because it's not just a student, especially if, you know, the parent is involved in on FAFSA and all that. And I, and I think that's where the conversation gets a little murky for the student athlete, because all of these kids have a pipe, not a pipe dream, but have a dream of me of going pro. And so the question is, how do I get my how do you get me enough exposure where I'm getting looked at by pro teams? Even though, like, the college system doesn't seem to be built towards the second and third tier guy going to the leagues. Like, you might get a G League spot, but you might be G League forever. Or you might get those overseas spots, but you don't necessarily need to go to college to get those overseas spots as long as you can play on a professional level. So, I don't and know. To that point, I just, I think about how that is what uh, some of these uh, student athletes, they want. They do want to go pro, however they can go pro, Right. But then I start to think about how much better are we than PWIs if we just we know a student wants to go pro and that they'll do whatever to go pro, but they may not necessarily be the best student that that they can be. They just want to go pro and want to have a chance. And the only thing that we might do or that some people do um, in terms of recruiting our student athletes is sell them that dream even though they are a terrible student. You're selling them a dream. They can't perform. They have not performed. But you're selling them a dream. But see, that's why, to campus. That's why I think what, what President Frederick and Howard said about hiring Blakeney was so poignant because he makes it very, very clear that Howard is not going to recruit students who don't meet their academic needs right they're very very clear about that and they are unapologetic about we will we will be more comfortable losing games in some ways it's if more we have students who meet yeah and, it, and that's that's a big thing now, i think and I that think really is my attitude so when i said i really can't relate to the question the first time because it's more than a game but Don't that's hard to do the, though because let me tell you yeah. why that's hard because or is your folks are on the on the bison express that's the fundraising mechanism for howard athletics they respect Howard's academic profile they get it at the same time they want to win because when you win that's how you get corporate sponsorships that's how you get people in the stands that's how you get people talking about you that's how you get media coverage so there are a lot of things that revolve around athletics so but I, there's one thing I, we're not talking about Jared, <laughs> and that's that's what, what's the, what's the number one issue with HBCU sports it's not it's not the student athletes it's not the quality of product it is sustainability. Mm -hmm. We have coaching carousels. I mean, I can't think. I can think of maybe one or two programs in the last couple of years that have had the same coach, same AD, 
and have won. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been, like, I mean, Nickelberry was at, was at Howard for forever. He didn't win anything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have programs that are extremely mediocre that have, you know, that, that have really, really, really good, you know, sustaining of, of, of um, executives and of coaches. But I think the biggest issue that affects all these schools, from Coppin to Morgan to any, I mean, even FAM, we look at these schools we cannot keep people there. And I think the issue is that coaches come and they do well at HBCUs, they leave immediately. Mm -hmm. Or coaches come and they do terribly and they can't get a job anywhere else so they stay and get stuck looking at, like, Norfolk State football. So <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when, you, when you talk about kind of where things are um, in the grand scheme, it's like, you know, we don't have – we don't have coaches stay for a long time. I mean, even I, mean, I know Broadway has retired and he's he's comfortable in retirement, but there was even some talk about when Broadway retired at, at A&T that there was some contract disputes and it wasn't it didn't sound like it was a clean break. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably our biggest issue with recruiting, even going back to Katie's point is that it's very difficult to recruit if you have no faith that your coaches who recruited you is going to be there when you're, you know, by the time you leave. And you just see, and you see Howard's top, the top, the leading scorer, me I player of the year is transferring. But it's interesting <laughs> because L Lavelle Moten has been at Central for for a number of years, and he's always up for a job. Um, and yet he still brings in enough talent that he's competitive in the MEAC where he's winning it. So yeah. I would, I, to your point, yes, I think I would like to see, and I think a lot of us would like to see lifers. We would like to see a return of like Big House Gaines. Um, you know, at Talmadge Hill, like you, you know, like guys that come to an HBC and we're going to be there for twenty years, and you can. But it didn't, didn't be that long. I mean, Lee Hall came to Morgan, won one won, won a share of a MIA championship, and was gone the next year. I mean, it literally, it literally is like we don't. When's the last time we had a big name hire? Even even look at London. How long did London last? Mm -hmm. London lasted two years. I mm -hmm. mean, it's. I just don't think that there's a way to be sustainable if it doesn't start with the coaching. But I, I think that there's such a such a money grab trying to get a big name that it may be better for coaches, I mean, for schools to find somebody to build with them who's, who wants to be at the program for a while and stay, like a Lavelle Moten, versus the carousel that we see um, in many ways. And unfortunately, you know, we don't have the money to pay these people to get them to stay. But even schools like Florida State, I mean, like Jimbo Fisher was making tons of money at Florida State and leads for Texas A&M for even more money. Right. So it's always going to be a, an arms race. It's never going to be good enough, but if we could have a bit more stability, I think that we'd see more results. I think part of it is you if the benchmark now is can you make the NCAA tournament and can you possibly upset somebody? That's a that's a high benchmark every year. And I think you be see what that did for them though. Bro, I mean and and I think that if we return to a thing where our benchmark of success is not did we make the NCAAs? But did we beat our arch rival? Like, did you? Yes, you want to be competitive. Obviously, you want to win the conference and all that. But there was a time where if you were in the CIAA, if you're Morgan, your goal was to beat Bowie. Like that made your season. Your goal is to beat Coppin. And if we go, if we go, if we go 14 and 14. Yeah, OK, we didn't do so well, but we beat Coppin, though. You know, and well, if, if you're North Carolina Central, we, we got we got to be we got to be A&T. We got to beat Winston. I think for the smaller schools or the, the yeah the smaller schools, I think the benchmark should be to win your um your, your conference tournament. Right. I, I mean, think that that should be uh, your goal every season because there's no way you're beating Zion Williamson. You're not, <laughs> and, and that's and that's what I'm saying. Like, if you just focus on if you and it's not to say like we should settle for mediocrity. That, that's not what I'm saying. But it is to say that if unless we're going to be like a Gonzaga. Or one of those schools where they consciously say it is time to commit to athletics and you start pouring money into it and your alumni start pouring money into it, which we know we can't afford, which we're not going to do. Then we have to get we have to get realistic and say, OK, then the best thing that we could do is really focus intensely on our arch rivals, our in-state and intra-city rivals and try to make that the most popping product that we can. Because right and now, to, if you don't, if you look at Howard versus Morgan in anything, it's a popular game. It ain't, it ain't the, it ain't the talk of the Beltway. Because they, because, because they don't put any, they don't put any. I mean, the other, day, remember they had the Howard Morgan game during spring break one year, like 
I mean, it's <laughs> it's ridiculous how. And again, I'm I try to be not to be too critical of Miak leadership, but even the Howard Morgan football game, the Coppin Morgan basketball game, even with some, even when A and T played Central. I mean, in basketball, like they this year was over like A and T spring break. I think like they have not done a good job of really capitalizing. I mean, when when Texas plays Oklahoma. It's a game. No matter how bad both. Teams no matter how are. bad they are, and then, and, and that's and, how Coppin versus Morgan is, and that's probably how Norfolk versus Virginia State is, and it should be how Howard versus Morgan is, but they're not. I do. They're not like that. I do want to ask this though, or at least throw this little caveat out there, because you, you mentioned me at leadership, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't isn't David Wilson sitting on a high high Ooh. position in the NCAA? <laughs> he just got he, he just got put onto a board this year. <laughs> Um, and he and, and he so, also and, and he also was the the chair of the uh, president's committee of the MEAC, so he's the he's the head president on the MEAC as well. And so now it's incumbent upon the Morgan State University president to at least inject some life into the MEAC sports. He trying to make he, he <laughs> but, see, to, <laughs> but see, but see, but see, but see, but see, it, it, it sounds so simple, but ninety five percent of the problem is that you have. You have a very, very wide breadth of, of schools and regions, even in the MEAC, even in the SWAC. Now, I think the SWAC does a better job, in, especially in football. I mean, yeah, they, do. They, have the, they have two classics in Dallas. They have, obviously, Magic City in Birmingham. I mean, they do mm-hmm. a really good job. But, again, most of those are run by the individual schools. So, right. But one thing I do think the MEAC could do better, again, is to create more opportunities with some of those Inter, um, inter area schools, but even more so, is again to find a way to create some sustainability within the within the process. Because the fact of the matter is, the MEAC will always be the baby to the CIAA. Yep. So basketball wise, no one is ever going to go to Norfolk for the CIAA for the MEAC tournament mm-hmm. ever. It's mm-hmm. never going to be what what Charlotte is and what Baltimore will become. But what the MEAC can do is they can do a bit more in terms of football, which we all know makes more money. And um, I think, yeah. that, you know, hopefully this year, hopefully, I mean, it would be cool if they could do, you know, more classic opportunities. Even if they did it one year or so, have a t play Central and Charlotte. I don't, know, I don't know one wants that, but <laughs> that'd be nice for a year, you know, to have, instead of Morgan playing up at Hughes, have it at M&T. There's different things they could do to make some money and, and generate some interest and some buzz. In the city, it, w- it would have helped when you know the mayor was still a Morgan State graduate. We oh want to we want to give a, a rest in peace to her <laughs> no. to her candidacy. Oh my god! And her chief of staff actually was, was a Howard graduate. Jeez, but man. um, but you know it's it's unfortunate you know kind of how that played out. But I think that there's hmm. more that can be done. But people have to be creative and let's, let's let's face it, like there is not a lot of interest right now with seeing HBCU sports on the grander scheme, which is why we're on ESPN three, basically. And so I think that if they can find ways to generate some more buzz, I mean, a and is a great example of a school that has a lot of buzz right now, but, um, you know, we need to do more and, and push for more. And, uh, but, but I think we got, a, we got a good example in, if you look at Morehouse, for example, Morehouse is in the dirt for a while and now they riding. They riding, they riding high because the last two years they gotten like twenty wins. They've had like 20, 22 game winning streaks. When they part, when they play Clark Atlanta, it's the talk of Atlanta. Like no matter what Clark Atlanta is doing, like if it's Morehouse CAU, like that's that's on eleven alive, like that's in the AJC. They're talking about it, right? So, you know, I. Th- th- there's a model for it, you know. There, there it can be but, done. You just got a few years ago, didn't um, Morehouse send somebody to the San Diego Chargers? Uh, pr- probably. I mean, it, yeah, but I mean, but it, has, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, let's not forget Morgan. Sure. M- Morgan and Howard had a huge game. This is probably two years ago, three years ago, where they played on ESPN on third on Thursday night under the lights. Nobody in Baltimore. There. They did. No one was there, but it did have actually did have pretty good views on TV. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I just think that again, you have to create an environment where people will will go and want to want to do these games. I mean, Morgan played Delaware State under the lights one year. And it was like maybe twenty twelve or twenty thirteen. No one came, of course. But I mean, I, I think that you have to create an environment where people want to go. 
And if it, and if it's going to be better to have Morgan play Howard in DC, which obviously we know it is, then then do that. Then Miak, make up your mind and make a decision. I mean, do you know how bad it looks on TV to see, you know, some of these stadiums empty? empty. <laughs> you empty. have to find other ways to get people to go. I mean, and we all know like family does great with getting people in the stands, but a school like Norfolk State has a has the biggest stadium in the MEAC, or thirty thousand seats. Or you so acknowledge we, that Morgan, you know, some stadiums just are literally not physically set up right. For example, at Morgan, our cameras, our our skybox is <laughs> over the home side. So when you look at the camera view, it always looks at the you're the shooting away at side, you're shooting is, at the the empty away side <laughs> when the home <laughs> side is full. So, so the <laughs> other thing that um. <laughs> That the schools can do is kind of like to follow the Army Navy model because you notice that stadium is always always packed. To play. Exactly, it's because they force the students to go. Now, granted, it's a little murky when you talk about you ain't gonna make Morgan Coppin Howard students go nowhere. The moment but you, you say, can incentivize them going, you could. Uh, we don't even stay on campus on Friday. We're not going to no games. Literally like, <laughs> after class, th- it's, it's cleared out on Thursday nights. It's, yeah, like. Like, I mean, we got to be totally real. Like, again, every what fam you can do, what A&T can do is a very different thing than what Morgan can do because of just the, the demographics of the school. And I think it's I think it's not it's not it's not smart to, to look at them and to create initiatives for them at the same way. And leadership from the MIAC office looks like we have to create different incentives. We have to create a different program for different campuses because the. The conference is so unique. It's not the same. Well, part of like, it is also have a winning culture, too, on campus. For example, you mentioned FAMU and A&T. They get good crowds because when you're winning, the guys and the girls consider that a place to be. Like, everybody's going to be there, so let me walk in there and make sure I show face. Morgan, if you if you, if you you walk into a Morgan game, it's like, okay, well, I mean, I just walked out the refact. I ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, so it's That's not great. it's not it's not a place to be. It's not a place to be seen, so you don't you don't invest in it. We're gonna give. Um, we're actually about to wrap this up because I like that we had a, a sports talk for a solid twenty three minutes. <laughs> Tiff, um, you uh, you <laughs> didn't so you didn't want it. You didn't want to participate in this conversation, so you're gonna have forty five seconds to to rant about your against sports. I just want to say that throughout all of this, I just. Uh, so many variations of Maryland accents. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Thank you. God bless. Good night. Oh my! Oh my! What goodness. is going on? What that was so much hate. I am. I am someone from my area who is in exile here in Texas. So I need mad. more love. She's so mad. My God! <laughs> it's because she's so not. She for, asked for me. Not for the mm. sports talk. Anyway, so this is this is a really great conversation because again, sports is the is the thing that that will get you the most eyeballs and the most butts and seats on the campus during any given any point in an academic year so it's not something you can you know just say oh it don't matter or you know what it is is what it's going to be like you got to keep having this dialogue especially about who runs these programs because they do shape the revenue and the face of what a lot of people think about our institution so (laughs) brothers i really appreciate it morgan um uh or is the morgan i thank you so much been a long time you're finally out of school um Katie, I love you dearly. Um, my brother, my brother. Despite uh, tuning in live from your car, um, nobody knew that though. <laughs> I had it on mute the entire ride back from the subway, which was delicious. Subway, please sponsor this podcast. Um, Tiffany, um, about to be thrown off the show. Uh, at least you made it through, um, and you were. In I am it. not being thrown off the show. And, and, actually, and, 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 I'm and, going. In essence, you threw yourself off for the last twenty minutes. <sighs> Because you talked about something that you know I don't necessarily want to talk about. <laughs> and you know my personal feelings around sports. We got to get over that, sir. Recruitment and enrollment. <laughs> don't well, we got to get over that sports stuff, sir. <laughs> no Just let kids it go. who don't qualify. Don't bring me no bad news. None of that. None and, of it. And we appreciate it. Another uh, wonderful episode of Dodgers After Dark. Again, thank you for all for listening. HBCDigest.com and on Sirius 142XM Radio the Howard University Radio Network. Uh, we'll be back, uh, what, hopefully next week? What? Is today Thursday or is today Tuesday? Never mind. You're you about to be thrown off, so we'll, we'll see. I'm not Next time, I just have to dart. Thanks for listening. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>